The devil is like a hungry lion on the prowl, looking for whom to devour and destroy. He's out there in the business of luring people, even the children of God, to his side. He is a thief, constantly trying to steal from us and rob us of God's joy and love. He doesn't even stop there. He's out to strike and destroy completely. I love the way the Gospel of John 10.10 aptly described him. John 10.10 the thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. The enemy pushes temptations your way. The temptations the devil pushes on us are there to do two things. First, to sin, and or for us to deny God. One of the devices of the devil is to push temptation in the way of believers. He tried it with Jesus in the book of Matthew chapter 4. He knew that Jesus had just finished fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and he was clearly famished. Matthew 4, 2 and 3. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He came bearing him the bait of food and worldly promises. The devil is very clever. Sometimes he will prey on our weaknesses or pressing needs and use it as a loophole to creep into our hearts. Every believer has different struggles. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 12.1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Listen to the choice of the words, the sin which so easily ensnares us. Everyone has a sin that so easily ensnares them. For some, it's pride. For some, it's anger. Others, it's lust. For some, it's sins of the flesh. Others, it's sins of the spirit. What the enemy does is come with that sin or tries to put you in a situation where he can tempt you with that specific sin. And in all honesty, the sin that easily ensnares us is usually a secret sin. A sin that no one knows about or a sin that very few people know about. And I know a sin that a lot of people struggle with is lust. Typically, lust is a secret that people struggle with secretly. Of all the sins with which we struggle, lust is the one we keep most firmly in the dark. If people knew the content of our thoughts, our dreams, our actions, we imagine repulsion and rejection would be the order of the day. Our instinct is to hide, to cover, to deny. There is a lie that lust is a male-only problem, and that is incorrect. Both males and females struggle with this. And the thing about lust is, it can be triggered by only one single look. The devil knows this, and this is why he has built society up in a way that everywhere you go, there are lustful billboards. Turn on the TV, and there are lustful advertisements. He does all he can to ensure he ignites that fire of lustful desire. And because lust tends to be a secret sin, he makes you feel as if there is something wrong with you, as if you are the only person in the world who struggles with this. For instance, have you ever had those thoughts? You know, those sinful, lustful, ungodly thoughts that come into your mind? You know, those thoughts that if other brothers and sisters in Christ knew about them, their opinion of you would change? The enemy will make you feel as if you are the only person that this happens to. And the truth is, you are not. It happens to women. It happens to men. 1 Corinthians 10.13 There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Don't allow the devil to make you think you are the only person who has to overcome lust and lustful thoughts that are thrown in your mind. 
But how can we deal with this temptation when the spirit of lust tries to tempt us? Yes, of course, there are spiritual things that we must do, but that is not what I will be focusing on today. I will be focusing on practical things we can do, just like my sermon on sexual immorality. The number one practical thing we should do is not look. Don't look. I know you have heard me say this, but this is real. All things to do with lust and sexual immorality all start with looking. Simply don't look. Samson saw a prostitute and ended up sleeping with her. Judges 16.1 Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went unto her. Look at what the Bible says, and saw. David saw Bathsheba, and we all know what happened there. Even if looking doesn't lead to physical action, Jesus raised the stakes on this one by saying that to look at a woman lustfully is to commit adultery with her. Matthew 5.28 But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Looking adds fuel to the fire. Let's say you struggle with pornography. You don't have to watch movies where the characters engage with one another. You are adding fuel to the fire. Let's say there is a co-worker you find extremely attractive. You don't have to search them up on social media and look and lust at their pictures. You are adding fuel to the fire. Don't add fuel to the fire. The next thing you need. To establish boundaries. The reason why this is important is because before people commit adultery or fornication, they typically have lustful thoughts. Lust is what opens the door to fornication, adultery, or masturbation. Now to help yourself not commit these things, set boundaries. And also, don't put yourself in situations where you have to make a decision. For instance, don't be alone with someone from the opposite sex. Don't ride alone in the car with someone of the opposite sex who is not your spouse. Hebrews tells us, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 12 It is not only effective to cut and divide, but Ephesians tells us that Jesus Christ has used the word to sanctify us. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. This is the potency of the word of God and this is what David is referencing in the psalm. He isn't satisfied with reading or simply listening to the word of God. That isn't sufficient to deliver the soul from the tight grasp of sin. We must hide it in our hearts. It is in the heart that sin is conceived through desires. Jesus states, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Matthew 15 verse 19 We must store the word of God in our hearts. McLaren states, The word if hid in the heart, will certainly be manifest in the life. This must be our motive too. We want the Word to keep us from sin and to manifest holiness in our inner life and our outer life. 